Welcome to WASM, Kubernetes, or what else, an enterprise architecture debrief. Uh, my name is Sean Isom. Today we're going to talk a little bit about Kubernetes, a little bit about WebAssembly, uh, a lot about how to build better applications through a more flexible architecture. Uh, this is kind of the latest installment in some of my talks about WASM and Kubernetes, but will also uh, likely be my last talk about that as uh, I don't really work with Kubernetes anymore. <laughs> Um, last month, I left my role at Adobe to go work with WebAssembly full time, uh, working on some really interesting and unique applications. So, uh, but there's still plenty of knowledge, uh, many, many years of experience uh, to draw on to uh, show some thoughts on this. So let's dig right in. Um, I always like to start my talks with the quote and um, uh, to form a thesis statement. And this is actually my own quote uh, for the first time ever. Um, all software architectures are bad, and that's okay. Um, we, can, we can go home now, right? Problem solved. Um, well, what, what do I mean by this, uh, other than it being a potentially inflammatory statement? Uh, simply that there is no perfect architecture, and the architectures are inherently ephemeral, ephemeral, they decay, they don't fix everything. Rigid architectures prevent you from being able to adapt to changing business requirements, and adherence to, let's say, suboptimal architectures uh, for consistency's sake, might ultimately cost more in the long run. Um, what do I mean by all this? Am I trying to put software architects out of a job? Uh, no, not, not at all. Uh, quick show of hands. Uh, this is a small crowd, but we'll see. Who here would say that they have a good architecture? Okay, that's one, two, yeah. Not very many people, right? Um, we tend to remember the bad parts and not the good parts. Uh, if you had a good architecture, how long did that architecture last? How long did it stay good? Okay, so yeah, not, not, not a lot of confidence yet in that. How many, how, okay, so if you've seen good architectures, how many examples of these? Do you repeatedly see good examples of architecture or do things tend to decay over time? I think we all typically know the answer to that. Let's shift gears. How many of you would say you were working under, a, maybe bad's not the right word, but a suboptimal architecture for your use case right now? Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I would expect. Um, okay, what makes your architecture bad? Any, anyone wanna throw anything out? Don't be shy. Age. Age, age is a good one. Did they start as a bad architecture? How has this evolved? These are all questions we should be asking ourselves as we're thinking through, can we build things that last? Um, this is pretty pessimistic, right? Like, do good architectures even exist? It would be easy to write this off and say, don't do architecture at all, if they're all ultimately going to be bad. Um, but my point is simply that most architectures aren't flexible enough to adapt to changing business or user requirements over time, which really just causes you to need to redo them or deal, deal with the peril of it, uh, watching it devolve and do things it was never designed to do in the first place. So, okay, uh, let's take another stab at that quote that may be a little bit more applicable. Your architecture probably isn't as flexible as you think it is. Um, architecture itself is not the problem so much as it, like rigidly adhering to an architecture that is designed around a certain system, a certain platform, certain bundled capabilities. Uh, the problem with this is as business requirements change, uh, if you're tethered into a specific runtime, specific hardware capability, what happens when you need to run that on another platform? Do you port all of your, let's say, bundled dependencies? Do you uh, rewrite it? Do you settle for a hacked version of it? We build architectures to bring some sort of stability to the entropy of like the chaos of, of business. Um, and we don't always know a whole lot about the execution environment at the time that we write it. So architecture itself isn't bad, but we should invert our traditional thinking about systems architecture as it probably isn't as flexible as you think. Here's an example I like to use of this. Um, who here has written a serverless function? Like I'll use the canonical example of an AWS Lambda. Have you ever tried to run that code somewhere else? I mean, other than your local box and some sort of you know shim. Yeah, it's, it's hard, right? Did you run the artifact directly? Um, you know, have you been able to lift and ship it to other cloud providers? Did you have to rip apart the code and you know, like 
structure a module that's got your interface with the raw cloud provider and a different module for your actual business logic. You know, you throw the dependencies in some sort of bucket and let the system deal with it. Like, th there's all sorts of strategies for this, but it's not easy to reuse that. Um, so let's now, this is a WASM conference, obviously. Let's shift gears to talk a little bit about how WASM can lead to that flexibility. Because you shouldn't, um, you should still try for that flexibility. And this is, this is my thesis statement. WASM components represent a more flexible approach for adapting your application's architecture to changing business requirements. I'm not here to convince you to not do architecture or to build for Kubernetes or to build for necessarily an architecture around WebAssembly. Um, my goal is to convince you to build your code for WASM by default, ship it as components, let it run in the environment that makes the most sense. Um, what, what is a typical application? You've got code, uh, which is hopefully mostly business logic and not boilerplate. You've got the dependencies that do the heavy lifting, uh, which your code is orchestrating. You've got data that those two things are intersecting and acting on. Um, you're likely processing or transforming input, uh, pulling data, joining, calling, processing functions, storing, sending results. Uh, essentially, you're brokering where that data is going. This leads to uh, dependency maintenance problems. Is anybody familiar with this graph on the right? This is from uh, the component model uh, repo. This is actually, it, this actually isn't 100% up to date. Some stuff has changed in this in the last couple weeks, but this is something called shared everything dynamic linking. And the basic idea is that when you've got an application DAG of dependencies uh, you know, that rely on all these different components, typically you'd have to statically compile all of those together. Um, if you've got dependencies of dependencies, if you watched you know, the earlier talk about dependency management, you see these huge tree-like structures where maybe you've got 10 different versions of libc pulled in. Um, that's bad, obviously. And so um, this is really re-architecting WebAssembly around the concept of being able to uh, share these modules, uh, each with their own linear memory, but within specific components, within specific capabilities for your application. Um, this allows us to untangle our dependency graph, uh, better isolate our business logic, and allow the system to take care of uh, providing those dependencies at runtime. This, this kind of shifts the dynamic, lessens the burden of uh, you know, application maintenance. Like I use the analogy of a container. You know, it's kind of the opposite of this. You take all of your dependencies and you throw them in there. And so uh, you, know, you as the application developer are responsible for providing a package which is a, a group of all of these dependencies that you ship out at runtime. But with this model, the idea is like you're focusing more on your actual application's logic. And that's, that's kind of the key goal of some of these more flexible architectures that we'd like to examine. And so this is, this is where I get to this, because obviously the title of my talk involves Kubernetes. And you, know, you hear a lot, hopefully a lot less now, but especially earlier this year, late last year, like, um, do I build for WebAssembly or do I build for Kubernetes? And um, I think that the whole WASM versus Kubernetes versus native versus what else is kind of a silly question. Um, you know, like what, what angle are you looking at this from? Um, are you looking at, at this from a platform engineering perspective? Are you looking at this as an SRE? Are you a pure engineer? Like I could see an argument where if you were part of a platform engineering organization, your job is providing compute as a product, for example. Um, okay, maybe this is a little bit more relevant question. Uh, you know, like what offering am I going to provide to my users? But as someone whose goal is maybe just writing that said business logic and being able to stitch these components together to form an application that hopefully does something greater than the sum of its components, why should you care? <laughs> I mean, unless you're you know, super tied into the Kubernetes ecosystem, you know, super tied into, and I'm picking on Kubernetes, super tied into serverless, super, super tied into whatever ecosystem that you're building for, why not abstract those dependencies away um, and, and view this through a like, lens of just wanting to be able to write that code faster and better. Um, you shouldn't be building, uh, let's say, Kubernetes native, uh, here, here, yeah, okay, here's, here's, a, here's a better example of this. Um, you shouldn't be building for Kubernetes native. You shouldn't be building for Apple Silicon native. You probably shouldn't be building for an AWS Lambda package if you're writing, let's say, a filter that's acting on data. You should be thinking in terms of streams, of what the format of that data looks like coming in, the format of the data coming out, and in terms of providers, that's then the back-end shim that's hooking into that data. Uh, you know, ba basic clean architecture. Um, if you're Google, if you're Meta, pick on anybody from there if they're in the room. Maybe sometimes native makes sense. Uh, you know, 
Um, if you control your own hardware environment, you build everything from source continuously, you have a mature build pipeline, you can replatform continuously to adapting requirements, um, that's fine. You can get that extra 10% of juice out of your resources at that kind of scale. Uh, the abstraction will add to the engineering com complexity. But um, at the same time, are you adding architecture just for the, for the sake of architecting? That, that, that's bad. Or if you're a small company, a, a startup bootstrap project that doesn't want to introduce additional complexity uh, that you may think lead to waste or something like that. So it's, it's kind of a negative line of thinking. Uh, and you'll, just, you'll notice a common theme here that uh, flexibility is the key. Um, where do we want to ship our code, assuming we build it as WebAssembly? Uh, there's this concept, I, I think, I want to say Luke Wagner came up with this quote, but write once, run, run anywhere. Um, I don't have to explain to this crowd what WebAssembly is, keep this very focused, but uh, obviously WebAssembly started a browser. So if you got a chunk of code, uh, why not run it in a browser? This is something that a lot of companies, including Adobe, had done to uh, enable new use cases for their products, uh, you know, reach a larger market share, or do things in a different way. Um, over time, obviously, WebAssembly just on the, let's, you know, this is a picture of a desktop, but the idea of just on a generic machine running outside of a web browser also makes sense. You've got things like plug-in models, you've got things like filters, you've got a lot of use cases where those same guarantees of isolated code, um, of uh, being able to um, you know, run this kind of native like code in a performant way makes a lot of sense. Carries its way over to things like IoT devices. Uh, if you've got code that's running in a web browser, you've got code that's running on desktop, um, why not run that same code on your smart fridge? Uh, I don't know, but there are, there are a lot of really interesting use cases for those IoT type devices. Same code, same package, why not run it on the edge? And this is where we start running into some really interesting uh, value that we might be unlocking for a business. Um, if you can run the same code client side, that might also make sense under different contexts to be able to run it on the back end or be able to run it on, on an intermediate edge device closer to the user. And of course, this leads to kind of the ultimate question of, if I've already got a cloud, I've already got a large amount of Kubernetes, you know, should I just use Kubernetes? Well, yes, you can do that, but why not run WebAssembly within Kubernetes itself as well? Uh, that's you know, another means to an end to leverage that existing infrastructure, be, be able to run these same chunks of code everywhere. And that's because these WASM components enable this interoperability. So from my viewpoint, others might argue with this, there's, you know, I, I view WebAssembly as an isolation technology. I don't think any other isolation technology really compares with that level of flexibility. You can uh, work across form factors. I didn't call it out here, but you can work across languages with components. You can work across devices and hardware to focus on that business logic. And so that's why I think we should invert our thinking of where our code runs. We should not necessarily be architecting something just directly for you know, Kubernetes, not the most convenient platform, but maybe where we're actually able to take best advantage uh, of our users, of our data. If you can move that code, move that compute closest to the, the use case for it, closest to the, to the device, let's say the end user device, closest to where the most amount of data is the most resident, you can increase the performance, decrease the overall cost of ownership of the application, while also being able to decrease the maintenance by not having to write little specific chunks of code for all of these different form factors. Um, okay, so quick aside, um, running Kubernetes and WASM is something I mentioned. There's a bunch of different ways to do this. This is a way that I have used before that works. This is, I wanna be crystal clear, this is not the only way to do this. Um, the, the basic idea here is you've got an existing Kubernetes cluster with existing namespaces. Um, you can leverage those namespaces for service level isolation. And so let's say service A, it's a log parser. Service B is processing image format, whatever. Um, obviously this is still a kind of trusted first party code in most circumstances, but you wanna be able to provide those isolation guarantees to treat it like a multi-tenant environment. And so um, what's interesting is now we're breaking out of that namespace level isolation to provide a a core a set of, in this case, WASM cloud hosts uh, that are going to be processing the actual WebAssembly logic itself. And this is, and the way this is safe with multi-tenancy, and I'm not a security person myself, I don't wanna you know, like provide security guarantees here or anything, there's a bunch of excellent talks about that, but in this case, um, is by leveraging uh, NAT's topics in WASM cloud, locking them down to a specific message prefix. Um, 
you know, obviously WebAssembly is not the, you know, just being a sandbox format is not the only security concern you have to worry about. But like I said, not my forte. This is a secure enough platform for first party code. Um, we've got this common pool of hosts. This allows us to reach economies of scale. So if you've got, let's say, a back set of Kubernetes nodes, you've got you know, larger pods that are running on them and um, you know, backed by, let's say, a cloud provider auto scaling group. Uh, this allows you to horizontally scale uh, as the number of WASM requests come in. And um, what, what's key and why, you know, why a lot of platforms, I would say, that operate within Kubernetes and, uh, sorry, operate WebAssembly within Kubernetes um, kind of diverge from this is they want you to build something new. And in this model, we've already got existing Kubernetes services that are container-based. Uh, inside the namespace, we've got uh, paths out to other, hor let's say, horizontal cross-plane dependencies. Uh, if you've got um, you know, calls service to service, if you've got calls out to external parts of your network, uh, different providers, you can still leverage those within the namespace. The idea is simply that you're going to hook up a service, you know, route traffic uh, over that NATS topic, run the WebAssembly code. If you need to go back out to another dependency in the web space, you can bi-directionally uh, connect to a provider that's present in that namespace already, which then can utilize those existing network peerings. Um, there's, uh, I'll put some links up there if you want to screenshot that. Uh, there's, you know, using WASM Cloud, there's a couple different ways to do this. The top one is, I would say, the quickest way. It does involve the, like, Cosmonic product, I think. Um, so if you want to kind of DIY it yourself just with WASM Cloud, uh, you can take a look at the uh, Kubernetes.sh script and hook it up using WADM to actually deploy the raw applications that are on it as well. So it's a bit of an aside, but point being, like, yes, there are tools out there that exist that allow us to run that same logic in Kubernetes uh, using WebAssembly that we run other places. Um, okay, so switching gears, let's look at architecture. So uh, now, where do you decide to run code? Um, let's say you've got an image processing function. That's what I know very well. Um, let's say you want to run that on device. Uh, you've got a user that's not making this decision themselves. Your user wants to do a thing. They want to, I don't know, like blur their background or something. Uh, you've got to make a split second runtime decision that says uh, on my mobile device, can I run this quickly? I've got like a Snapdragon processor and maybe not a super powerful GPU. Um, you know, other concerns are do, do I have the data resident, right? Like if I push this out to the back end, does that mean I have to move that giant, you know, like raster images are large, I have to upload that, you know, very quickly to some sort of, uh, you know, more powerful device. Um, we've got this concept of edge. Edge is a huge topic that I will just be you know, <laughs> not an edge expert myself, but I, you know, it, it's a viable option, as you see here, for a lot of web, running WebAssembly. And the idea is that let's, let's get a more powerful device, let's say the idea from my perspective, let's get a more powerful device in that chain that can run some of this code that is a backend, but that's a backend that's closer to the user. The challenge with edge really is more about caching and data residency. Um, edges are great if you need to request an operation and then request it again. Same time for the user or for a bunch of different users that are geographically clustered. Um, if you don't have that data for that dependency, if, if you've always got to call back to a data center to get the data to run it on the edge, why would you run the compute in the, on the edge in the first place? And so like data center, and I say data center, I can also mean cloud, basically traditional uh, backend computing environments uh, still, have, still have a large place here. Um, the key decision maker is like, You've got a taxonomy of fast to slow, typically, and you've got to run that compute unit uh, where the data makes the most sense. Um, okay, so we talked about data. What about dependencies? Um, this is actually, uh, I tried to get an updated graphic from Joe and could not right before the talk, but uh, the idea is programming your dependencies to interfaces as well. So if you look at you know, some of the history of WASI and what it's done over the years, provi providing core system capabilities, uh, you see at the very top there, we've got something called WASI Cloud, now WASI Cloud Core. And so with this, we're providing higher level common interfaces to be able to do things that your code might depend on. And same idea, right? Like I don't necessarily want to uh, code something directly against an interface provided by a cloud provider. I want to take a shim in a standardized way to plug in that WebAssembly module so we could run it on a plethora of backing stores. And so this leads us to the concept of dynamic scheduling. And so now that we've got a chunk of WebAssembly code that we can run on any device using pluggable dependencies, um, why not ship your code everywhere by default if WebAssembly modules are so small, if with components we can do dynamic linking? 
uh, we can actually start outsourcing some of these scheduling decisions to our runtimes. Um, and you can algorithmically model this. This is a framework that I have used before. This is not the only way to do this. I want to be clear. Just like all things in architecture, there's many different ways to do this. Um, but you know, some metrics that make sense to me, uh, this CPU cost, which I, and all these you know, have a custom weight factor. You can, like, say your cloud provider is giving you a huge discount on CPUs. OK, maybe you would weight the CPU cost lower. Um, but the sum of the, the, the CPU time times that weight. Um, if you want to run it on an edge, the cost to, um, well, something goes resources times the rate that the edge provider is charging times the accuracy of the edge, which I define as cache misses, essentially, that require you to go back to the back and store. Uh, the cost of storage, and storage uh, replicated both at the edge. Storage, storage on the client side, let's assume, is free. So storage on the edge versus storage on the back end. Uh, these are going to have uh, a duplication factor sometimes, so being able to dedupe across that. Multiply it times the bytes, multiply it times the rate. Latency, um, obviously, if you're making more network calls synchronously in a chain, uh, you're summing across the different providers. Um, I use a fudge factor in here because there is some latency that's always expected. Let's say calling a database. That is something that never happens in real time. If something's stored in a database, you always have to call a database. So I have that as a static factor. And then lastly, I, <laughs> I call this Kubernetes compute, but really, like, what is the, the data center or cloud or back end cost? Which, same thing, summing the resources. Uh, Kubernetes is kind of interesting. I've given a few other talks about this, about overhead in Kubernetes. And so you don't have to just be considering the cost of your code running, but also, like, if you're running your own clusters, what is your idle percentage of your CPU? Um, you know, what are the back end cloud provider resources that are necessary to run that compute as well? Um, and then egress, which is also a huge factor. So obviously, if, if you can run something uh, on device and not have to move lots of data around, most cloud providers, ingress is free or relatively cheap depending on net, your network topology. Uh, egress is usually very significantly expensive, especially the public internet. So being able to minimize that typically gets weighted higher in data intensive applications. So why not write a little chunk of code that can measure latency, let's say, and decide, uh, do I run this WebAssembly module locally, or do I make a call to the local edge? The, you know, if you can have a ping time or you can have a graph of different edge nodes that you can interrogate at, at runtime, um, or run, you know, actually run it back to the data center. I think this is something that's fully practical uh, today. Okay, so um, I'd be remiss not to give actual examples. Uh, we've talked a lot of theory. Um, let's, let's dive into three specific examples. Uh, first is you know, image processing, image transforms. Obviously, coming from Adobe, this is a huge thing that we do. Um, here's the concept of a separable image transform. Like This is, a, this is a, a convolutional blur, for example, where you can separate it as an M by N matrix. Uh, as a matrix, that means you can run processing in parallel. So uh, can I separate the processing of this blur out? And also, OK, to be clear, if this is 128 by 128 pixel image, like, this is going to take no time. What if you have a 30 megapixel? What if you have a 300 megapixel image? That, you know, what if you're doing this on a batch process of thousands and thousands of, like, let's say, stock images that you're trying to catalog? So that's where you can see some of this starting to, to add up. Um, and so where, you know, when you've got those larger things, where is the most resident data? Also, like, what if you're trying to run a non-separable transform, like you have on the right? Um, and if you want to know more about image transforms, that's a great blog post where I stole these images from because I did not want to write my own. Uh, so, all right, how, how do we build this? Um, and the answer is it depends. Uh, it depends on all of those metrics I just described, right? Like if it's that smaller image, if like, let's say it's a, it's a smart device, you've got a camera, you've got a camera filter app running on it. Um, you've got that cheap compute locally. Uh, you've got a local cache with the, with the data. The data is resident. Um, if your GPU load is low, if you've got a high you know, power device, high battery, uh, typically this can be run most efficiently on the client. But whereas if it's, um, you know, let, like let's say an, an image uploading function, if you've got a stack of images that you just took and you need to upload them and, and operate on that data. And that's where like run it, pushing out to a constrained edge device to run some of that processing can make the most sense, especially if that processing on that edge device is cheaper than running all of that processing all the way back in your core data center region. Um, 
But, you know, okay, let's say you're actually doing batch processing on a stack of images that's already resident in a cloud device. Uh, in that case, like, okay, um, maybe the store, maybe you run Kubernetes on the cloud region already where that backing storage is, and so that networking is cheap, that networking is quick. Um, what happens if you need to send all that back to the user device? Okay, well, that inverts the entire equation. Now it might make more sense to run it closer to the device itself. Uh, another really unique example, uh, procedural content generation. Um, and so lots of times in geometry and in machine learning models, you've got uh, large data sets. And sometimes you can stream in the code to generate these data sets uh, instead of actually streaming in the data set itself, running the code to generate the data sets on device or on edge. You exchange that bandwidth latency for runtime cost. And so like in this example, you know, you've got a client device, it's got a GPU, it's got a graphics engine, and it's gonna go out to an edge device that has a graphics service. And this service decides whether I pull, uh, well, first of all, like, do I have this data resident in the cache? If not, I hydrate my cache. Um, the process of hiding, hydrating the cache is not really relevant here. But at this point, let's say I've got the, the, gram, the formal grammar, I've got the set of instructions, I've got the set of code to execute this data. Do I run this? Uh, generation step on the edge, and, or do I send back the procedural grammar back to the client side and allow it to actually run the generation on the client? And so a few factors that can come in here is, um, like, do I have heuristics? Am I going to need to run this generation step again? Like, have end users access the same data within the same edge location within the last M hours, for example? Uh, do, you know, or is this fresh data? Um, is this expensive data that um, I know, uh, I, I keep using GPUs as an example, because that's what I know, but like, do I know that I've got a more powerful um, computational framework at this edge device than I do on the client side as well? And so the answer is you can send either back, make, a, make that program at programmatic decision at runtime, um, and at the end of the day, you either just uh, generate it on edge or generate it on the client side. But the end result is you still get that pretty picture on the right, on the client device, upload to the GPU. It's just a matter of what business metrics make the most sense for that generation. Is it latency? Is it egress cost? Is it compute, et cetera? Uh, last example, um, if you've been paying any attention at this conference at all, uh, ML inferencing is a huge thing now, where as it kind of wasn't until recently. Um, uh, an example that resonates for a lot of people is user impressions. Like let's say you've got a web-based advertising system. If you can bring uh, the processing of some of those impressions closer to the actual user that's using them, you can increase performance, decrease latency. And so, why is my mouse not working? My computer frozen. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so you can, you can leverage edge caching um, for better data locality, especially if you've got a user that is you know, repeatedly, maybe through a multitude of devices that are behind the same network, you're shopping on your smartphone, you're shopping on your computer, right? Like maybe you can run that uh, inferencing step closely on the edge um, instead of having it uh, take more latency. So, okay, we've got a user, um, and the basic request path here is you hit an edge device, um, you know, I hit a button on a web page, sends a cookie, um, sends a token from a cookie uh, to, let's call this a profile service. And the profile service looks up the user, says I can identify the user that's on this device, um, and I want to run some personalization for this user based off of this user token. Uh, do I have, like, first of all, like, do I know who this user is? Um, if so, do I have data for it in the cache? And if so, can I, do I have a model resident? These are all three different things. But in the happy path, you can. And then you can furthermore, you know, send that back asynchronously over a topic to the data center for further processing. Because a lot of these real-time inference models like do back-end retraining over time, or the model's updated over time. You've got your friendly neighborhood data scientists over there constantly changing your model. Um, but the idea is that um, if it's not on, present on the edge already, you can go to the data center, you can hydrate that data, get it out of the database, and then put it back on the edge and it stays warm on the edge for a specific period of time that might be average to a user session. Okay, that was a lot. Um, are, is this, or this, not this, are these architectures bad? We just looked through a bunch of different architectures, I started the talk saying architecture is bad. Um, well, we did refine that definition. I'd like to think that at the core, uh, 
uh, these are flexible architectures at runtime because we've abstracted away those dependencies, uh, we've separated the business concerns, split up the business logic uh, to run it where it can be closest to the data and closest to the use case itself, independent of the runtime or the underlying hardware. But really, uh, this is an exercise left up to the reader uh, when it comes down to nuts and bolts implementations. No architecture is perfect. They will decay over time, inevitably. It doesn't matter how flexible you think your architecture is to start. But I think WebAssembly represents a unique opportunity to ship this code by default to a variety of form factors and allow you to kind of decrease that decay, increase the flexibility. Um, do we validate our, our thesis? Uh, it depends. <laughs> Uh, there's always some ambiguity, but let's go back to our initial criteria uh, that's kind of subjective. Did we build a good architecture? Well, I don't think good architecture exists. I think more flexible architectures exist. Did we pick the right runtime environment? Did we solve this Kubernetes versus WebAssembly question? Uh, I maintain that that is not the right question you should be asking. Um, we brought, we brought our code closer to our data, but like I said, it's an exercise left up to the reader. This is often ambiguous, like data processing often goes through multiple steps. And what, uh, where you run your processing of the data, where you run things like image filters can change over time. Like actually, here, here's an example, right? How many of you have been asked to add AI into your product at some point over the last year? Yeah, like a, a year ago you, would you have thought that that would be a thing? Probably not. This all sprung up overnight, right? So point being, like, the requirements change over time. Where data is most resident changes over time. And here we've made ourselves more flexible to that. Um, I'm also not going to make the claim that WebAssembly is necessarily cheaper or more performant than native. Um, there are people that do make those claims. Uh, but what I can say is that I think it decreases overhead and uh, allows you to be more flexible with where you ship your code. Um, spe spe ugh, specifically, more flexible in the face of business entropy or chaos. So all architectures atrophy over time. Flexibility is key. Um, that's it. Uh, hopefully, there's a few architectural nuggets you can take away from that. Um, I'm actually, uh, we got a little bit of time left. I have a quick demo. Um, I threw this together the other day. So. Uh, I actually implemented number two, content generation step. <laughs> and so you can see what I'm talking about in real time. Is this gonna work? Yes, okay, cool. So that building right there, that is a set of WebAssembly code uh, that I just compiled through Emscripten. Um, this is actually, the code to generate this building actually exists on an edge device. I won't say where, but exists on an edge device. Was pulled down at the start of this program. You saw it took about a one second to generate that building, right? You just watched over the last 10, 15 seconds this is being maps data, for example, the streaming of all of the rest of that data coming in, uh, pretty sure it's backed by a Kubernetes server, right? So the idea here is that by shifting that compute to where it makes the most sense, I was able to increase my application's performance. So um, yes, if you're curious, I'm working with WebAssembly and graphics. So if you're interested in the intersection of WebAssembly and graphics, please come talk to me. And uh, that's it, thank you.